So hello everyone and welcome to the latest edition of Sofia Crypto Meetup. This is the 57th edition of um, yeah, our little local Sofia Meetup here. So um, yeah, I'm happy to have you all. Um, so today, as you know, we'll be talking about tokenization, which is, a, I think, a, a, a topic which is growing in excitement. And um, I'm not sure why is it, why is, um, yeah, what, why are people talking more about DeFi and NFTs and not uh, so much for tokenization, but I guess this is something that we, we will discuss uh, a bit later with Kasti Dali, I would say. Yeah, maybe she will, she will pronounce, her, pronounce her name better uh, when she introduces herself. But as you know, before we, um, before we go into the main topic, we have a couple of things to go through. I have, a, I have a surprise for you today, something that we haven't done yet. And that's related to the um, yeah, person who will be presenting the, uh, the news a bit later. Uh, but before that, let me go through the um, standard uh, uh, yeah, updates by our sponsors. Um, so we have uh, Nexo. Uh, I went through like what they have been up to this month and it's again quite a lot. Um, I know that uh, many of you are yeah, kind of interested in how Nexo stores uh, or, or, or takes custody of, of users funds and like what, what insurance does it have. So they have prepared a blog post dedicated precisely to that topic and you can find it on their Twitter and in their uh, blog. Um, they also did a donation of $150,000 to uh, this organization called the Brink, which uh, is focused on supporting open source Bitcoin development, which is um, great. And uh, yeah, as, as you know, uh, Bitcoin developers, uh, is, it's, it's a huge community of develop developers uh, worldwide, um, and most of them are not getting paid for contributing to Bitcoin. Um, and uh, yeah, there are a few organizations uh, and, and also companies which are trying to change that. Then uh, Nexo uh, went with the wave of um, NFTs. Um, yeah, caught the, the wave of, of, of NFTs and, um, and actually launched their own collection of NFTs. And you can, he you can see here uh, one of these uh, moon pieces or moon boy pieces. I, I think it's pretty cool. I'm not sure what the price is uh, of, of that, but it, it generally I like I like how it uh, looks. So you can have a look. There are a few more um, cor color options I think for the Moon Boys. Uh, yeah, have have a look and possibly uh, yeah get one for for the for the grandkids. Um, then they organized an uh, Ask Anthony Anything session. Um, which is recorded and also uh, already available. Uh, you can find it in their so communication, social media channels. Um, and today they shared an announcement that uh, due to the Easter holidays, withdraw withdrawals might be a bit delayed between April uh, 1st and April 5th. So if you're planning to withdraw some funds from, from Nexo, uh, do that before well, I mean, now, <laughs> I guess, since tomorrow is April the 1st. And then when it comes to BitHop, we have, um, we, we, we have uh, uh, a few announcements here, here to make as well. Um, let me just quickly check that we are, we, we are live here in, uh, in the group. Um, right, great. Uh, so yeah, in relation to BitHop, we have uh, launched a new campaign, actually the second campaign with the Aut Autism Today Association. Um, the first one was a great success and actually, um, yeah, thanks to Bitcoin, uh, the association managed to start the reconstruction of a center dedicated to uh, basically care and education of children with special educational um, needs. And that one, that one was in Burgas. So the second campaign will be dedicated to a similar center, but this time for one in Vratsa. And also we distributed $2,500 from the ones sent to the general Bitcoin address to five campaigns, um, which were announced on BitHop. 
All right, so with that said, let's go through the, uh, the graphics. I mean, uh, amaz amazing performance by both Bitcoin and Ethereum this month. As you can see, the, the graph uh, speaks by itself. Last time it was about 50,000. Uh, now it's close to 60,000. So we are very, um, very close to all time highs. And an interesting thing uh, was that when people looked at the previous all time high, um, when usually when you look at the graph and people look at the previous all time high, the graph looks like, uh, yeah, this, this all time high will never be reached. But the fact is that once it is reached, um, the, the, the next all time high makes this previous all time high peak look like a, like a tiny little, um, I don't know, speck there on the graph. And that's, that's what uh, Bitcoin does. Um, so um, for Ethereum, as you can see, we are above all time high levels as well. And yeah, the cryptocurrency continues to grow in value, uh, continue to grow in value throughout March. And then for the March headlines, and this is my little surprise that we have that I, that I have here, um, uh, we have a special guest. Actually, the, the special guest will be joining us this time with uh, through through a recording, but hopefully in the future uh, she will be able to um, to do this live. But before that, uh, let me show you what what the community voted on. I mean, in the last couple of days, there were a few uh, more big news that uh, that were announced, as uh, for example, PayPal enabling um, uh, well first incorporating USDC and then enabling the uh, basically more than 30 million, I believe, uh, merchants in, in the States to basically allow uh, to, to accept uh, payments in cryptocurrencies. So that's, I think, what uh, an important news, but there were a few quite big pieces of uh, news being shared in the last couple of days. Nonetheless, I think this one, these are also quite, um, yeah, quite, quite good. So for them, I will have to open a video and hopefully you'll be able to, able to hear because this is the first time we are playing a live video with sound uh, on Zoom. So hopefully, yeah, you'll be able to uh, hear everything. So there we go. This is my little surprise. We have... Uh... Hello. <laughs> we have uh, Milica Dimitrova. Hello everyone and welcome to to present the news. Sofia Crypto Meetup. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Melitza and it's a pleasure for me to go through all of the hottest crypto news from the last month. The first news that you chose is AIP 1559. One of the most important events in the Ethereum world is the Ethereum Improvement Proposal. As we all know, the higher fees make it hard for the system to scale and that's why there are some changes in the fees. AIP 1559 changes the way users pay Ethereum's transaction fees. Currently, fees are paid to the miners for processing transactions, right? The cost, the cost of those fees depend on the supply of the miners and the user's demand for them. If the network is too busy, the miners can charge higher fees of over $20 per transaction, and that's not good, as we all know. The decision AIP-1559 would replace the supply-demand fee style with the standard rate across the network. The fees for the transactions would rise when the market is too busy and fall when it's too quiet, which is actually better. In addition, Ethereum will become a deflationary asset. As we all know, Ethereum doesn't have a limit on its supply, but by the new update, the currency will have a deflationary element. The fees for the transactions would not go to the miners and they will be burned. Is this will make Ethereum more user-friendly? Perhaps yes, because everybody would like to pay lower fees, right? Especially with all of these projects on Ethereum's code. The second news that you chose is the stimulus package of 1.9 trillion in the US. During the month, the US Senate passed President Joe Biden's nearly 2 trillion stimulus package. The idea of this stimulus is to help the US economy to recover after COVID-19. Actually, these stimulus checks are one of the biggest government innovations since the World War II. 
more money in the system mean higher price for the assets that can store their value and as we all know bitcoin is accepted as a hedge against inflation during the last month many institutions allocated portions of their cash positions to crypto mainly bitcoin they all try to protect their savings against the inflation tsunami i hope that they will can but let's talk about the retails the interesting part of the story is that many Americans are thinking about investing their stimulus package on Bitcoin and the stock market. According to the banking firm Mizuho Securities, nearly 40 billion of the 380 billion in the like stimulus checks could go to the market. This means that every American believes that they can earn money through the crypto and the stock market. To become a trader is actually easier than ever before. And the last news that you chose is Tesla buys Bitcoin. The bull market went even more bullish after the richest man of the world invested in Bitcoin. Tesla CEO Elon Musk bought BTC for 1.5 billion and it wasn't just buying thousands of billion. The company will start accepting them as a payment for its products. Musk added that the firm will keep Bitcoin it reserves rather than switching them for fiat such as the USD dollar. This means that Tesla CEO believes in the future of the digital assets. Some of the other institutions which added Bitcoin to their balance sheets are MicroStrategy, Square and the Chinese mobile business app Me Too. Thank you for the watching and enjoy the meeting. Bye. Well, that, that was uh, Melissa who, who's cool, I would say specializes in uh, yeah, delivery of, of news and she's actually one of our youngest members of uh, Sofia uh, Sofia crypto meetup and I'm super uh, super glad that young people are looking into crypto and are actually so eloquent when um, uh, presenting news I, I believe uh, she, she she's uh, she's doing she did and actually will be doing a great job in the future and you can follow her um, updates which are actually in Bulgarian and published uh, on the on the Sofia um, crypto meetup Facebook page I think once per week or quite quite frequently. So thank you, Melissa. And next time we'll see you live delivering the news. Uh, if you, of course, if you choose to, to join. And now I think it's uh, high time to jump into the main discussion um, with Cassidy. And hopefully she is still with us after uh, like these 20 minutes of updates. Um, yeah, I, I can see her. So let me stop the sharing of the screen and go to uh, yeah this this view so hello hello Cassidy and uh, super super thank you for being here with us and talking uh, yeah and yeah helping us discuss the topic of tokenization so before we we start uh, I guess it's uh, it's normal to kind of mm, uh, yeah, commence with a little uh, introduction on your part about yeah your background and uh, how did you first um, got interested into uh, blockchain technology and crypto? Cool, yeah. Um, so first, thank you for, for having me. Uh, nice to be here. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, so I started off in politics first and then I moved into economics and I got interested in blockchain first specifically, um, basically as a way that an, a tool that we have that can help us um, basically rebuild a lot of systems that we have from the ground up and create different ways, different systems um, from the traditional systems that we have and many of them are broken. And so I saw it as a way of basically reimagining what things can, can look like going forward and a, a really nice um, like way forward in this crypto space. I think you are on mute. Sorry. Uh, it's interesting because, um, you know, I, my, my background is also uh, politics. And um, yes, I, I also saw blockchain as really the only chance that our society has to kind of have uh, or establish an alternative financial or let's say banking system, or at the very least alternative money 
that uh, that uh, are actually uh, not subject to uh, well well they are subject to politics but not subject to the same i guess uh, dynamics that uh, and the same control that is customary in the uh, yeah in the current current financial economic financial system that we we live in and uh, so so when did you first heard about bitcoin that's what i'm uh, like interested in. and how when you heard about it did you <laughs> immediately like what was your first reaction because you know when i first heard about bitcoin for me it was um, yeah this is some kind of a geeky stuff that uh, i don't really understand uh, so yeah i'm just gonna not be interested in that for now so how was it for you so i actually learned about ethereum first um oh, okay. and good. yeah i heard it from a friend who was mining ethereum and um and then he also said that he was mining bitcoin eventually but that was like the first with well, the first thing that i learned about and um i think it was like maybe a month after this conversation i met someone who was working i don't know if you know this company called consensus yes. um but they were just getting started and she was the first employee telling me about how she imagined this world computer basically um reimagining how we uh how we use like um uh these like smart contracts um and being able to have a computer that's not just like run by me but have things that are executed um that are trustless uh yeah. was like the the big buzzword there right mm -hmm. um and for me this was um actually a little bit more interesting at the time than just bitcoin so I think there's a lot of power in having, like you said, this money that's separate from government. Um, and I think this can be extremely powerful. And then there's also another, a whole other power that comes with um, being able to have contracts that are set up, um, whether it's between people or between companies or, um, or just yeah. different processes that happen um, trustlessly. And I think yeah. for me, this was what was uh, really exciting to start diving into myself. Um, and, yeah, and yeah. actually, DeFi is kind of like the first major like attempt to actually um, yeah bring these uh, benefits to the wider masses. Um, I, it, I guess if we ignore the ICO phase of 2017, um, yeah, and, um, um, and 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 then like when it comes to uh, Ethereum, and I know that Centrifuge is actually not built on Ethereum. So, so can you tell me like, how, how did you decide to join Centrifuge and possibly why? And why did you guys like, not decide to go with, with Ethereum? Was it scalability or was it something else? So I first tried to start my own project um, and that didn't work out, but that was in the, in the crypto space focused on reputation. And so then from there, I was, I was freelancing for lots of different projects on token economics. Mm -hmm. um, so because this was what I was really studying and focused on, I was trying to apply that in, in the crypto space. Um, and that's when I met Centrifuge and really liked what the project was doing because I saw it as a real opportunity to actually change the way that traditional finance works. I think it's a nice mix of being like on the edge, really trying to push the boundaries, but also the team, um, they are experts in supply chain finance and super close to the way things work today. And so I think this makes them really well positioned to actually make a change that can fit in how things work now, but still push them forward at the same time. So for me, that was a, a big reason why I decided to join full time. And, and like you said, so we have a centrifuge chain which is our own chain that we built using something called Substrate, mm -hmm. um, which is basically like a, a toolbox um, that Parity built for mm -hmm. projects like us who want to build their own chains, but don't want to do everything from scratch. Yeah. Um, so it, it gave us a, a really um, clear way of like getting started. Um, mm -hmm. But when we originally started, this tool wasn't available. And so we actually did start building our main dApp called Tinlake on Ethereum first. Mm -hmm. So Tinlake is still on Ethereum and, and it's still there also because um, 
it's that's where most of DeFi exists today is on Ethereum. Um, and one thing that we find exciting is this um, like multiverse of blockchains that's popping up right now. Yes. And we really see like a multi-chain future coming. So I think there will still, of course, be a lot of DeFi on Ethereum, but we're really excited for the DeFi that's going to be coming into lots of other ecosystems. So mm -hmm. we're, our next integration is with uh, the Polkadot ecosystem. Yes. Yeah. And they'll be launching parachains really soon. So then uh, we're planning on launching our chain as a parachain there. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be like the first next step, but really we hope to integrate with um, you know, all kinds of different chains and DeFi projects. And I think this will be just growing even more and more as we see more chains coming up. Yeah, I think this is, uh, I think in exactly the same way, I, I believe most of the dApps which are com coming out currently will be blockchain agnostic. And I think uh, thanks to what yeah, Polkadot are, are doing um, and also what Cosmos is doing, um, yeah. I believe, uh, yeah, the future is definitely multi-chain and it will be much easier. It will be very easy to move from chain to chain. Um, and I, I already see that uh, with, uh, with MetaMask supporting uh, several chains just through the, yeah, like through, uh, through, the, through the MetaMask uh, uh, option to, to switch the network. Um, and if the Ethereum EVM is supported, uh, then the addresses are also this, uh, similar Ethereum addresses, so it gets uh, yeah even even uh, um, yeah much easier to integrate or to launch on two chains at the same time. Um, yeah, great. So um, when you mentioned Finlake, so is is Finlake the um, the app that actually generates the um, uh, tokens which are kind of used as or, or yeah, kind of uh, use like as collateral or that represent uh, real world assets. Um, I know that you have this um, uh, system with two tokens. Um, yeah, exactly. And uh, this, that's also interesting because uh, I believe uh, that's how you basically manage risk. Um, so what I'm uh, actually just before going in that direction, um, I learned about centrifuge a while ago, but how I, um, how I learned about it was interesting because I had an idea that um, basically if I'm going into DeFi, I also like thought about my own personal project. And I thought that you have to, uh, DeFi is really great in unlocking value. Um, so some stuck value from the real world that is just staying there, not being used, that could be very valuable in DeFi. That could be used as collateral in DeFi, that could be used, uh, if, for example, if taking out loans. And so I was thinking of like, where is like this value stuck? And then I, I thought about invoices. I mean, the invoices that wait to be cleared for, for months. And um, these people like kind of like, like the companies behind them cannot get paid or they have to use uh, some factoring services uh, like by like going to banks, for example. And that's actually how I found uh, Centrifuge. I was wondering like, is someone from the DeFi space doing this? And then I, I found you. So you kind of you, you kind of spoiled my idea there, <laughs> but but that's uh, that's uh, perfectly fine. And and then later you, you introduced this uh, token system. So can you like talk about the dynamic between uh, like Thin Lake and uh, the two tokens? Which uh, yeah, one is Thin, and yeah, what well, the other one is Drop. And I also know that you have a Wrapped token. So. Can you talk about like how these things interact and yeah. What yeah, is sure. So you're definitely spot on. I mean, that was where the idea from Senderfuge started was financing invoices specifically. Mm -hmm. And we built everything in the beginning with that vision. And once we had Tinlink, we actually realized that this could be used for all kinds of different assets, not just invoices. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we have eight different asset pools and they range from things like invoices to inventory, to real estate, and even music royalty payments. Um, so all kinds of different things there that, that we're able to, to unlock um, liquidity for, just like you said. So um, it's really cool that you, that you also were thinking of this. Yeah. Um, so the way that we structured it, um, 
you lock these assets into Chainlink in the form of NFTs. So with Centrifuge Chain is how we're minting the NFT. And we have a bridge now to Ethereum. And that's where our Tin Lake DAP is pooling these NFTs together. And it mints um, drop in tin. They're effectively LP tokens. So if you've used any other of these DeFi projects, you know these LP tokens, they're ERC20 tokens, they're fungible, and they represent your share in this pool of assets. So drop in tin, they are just this, this exact same concept that we're using for tin link. They are representing your share in this pool of assets. So you lock in DAI and you get back a, a certain number of, of drop or tin that represents the DAI that you locked in. And as these um, assets get paid back, as the loan gets paid back, your drop would rise in value according to what's paid back, uh, according to the interest rate of the pool. And um, the, the risk that you mentioned, one way that we're addressing it with having this two token structure is that drop is the senior token and tin is the junior token. And what that means is that um, if an asset were to default, this junior tranche would get hit first. And so if you wanna take less risk, you would uh, put your lock your tokens in and get drop tokens into the senior tranche so that you're protected from the uh, first losses that would go to the, the TIN investors. But for, being, for taking that risk um, and investing in this junior tranche, you would get a higher interest rate. Mm -hmm. And so it's really up to the investor then weighing those choices. If you um, mm -hmm. would, would be in a position to take more risk, then you would be able to invest in the junior tranche. Um, and then also for, um, for the projects that we work with that are bringing in these assets, um, for them to have skin in the game, they're also investing in this junior tranche. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, so, so this, this sounds like a, like a, like a great token, token design for managing risk. Basically, if I want, I can just buy uh, tin and that's high risk and uh, if I, I'm not that risk prone I can buy drop um, and again I guess make a mix of the of both of those so buy like 90% uh, drop and 10% tin or something like this um, so what I'm also interested in though uh, is like kind of like the tokenomics and the system design might be yeah uh, it's a bit clear we can we can talk about the red token a bit later but um, so, 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 so this part when we enter the blockchain is kind of uh, more or less clear. You, you deposit that, you get the tokens and you, you get rewarded with uh, some API. Um, so my first question would, would be um, um, like how, is this API a single API for the, for the pool or, or, or I guess there are two different APIs for the pool. And my second question would be what's happening before we enter this, uh, like the world of blockchain, how, how, are, how are these assets actually being tokenized uh, from like, uh, like what, is, what is the road they take from the real world to the blockchain? Like, is there regulation involved? Like, are these companies doing, doing it themselves? Are you using uh, like notary services or how does, this, how does this work? So right now it is, um relatively centralized in the sense that um, it's all falling on one entity that's bringing in these, these assets for a specific pool. Mm -hmm. So right now as a user who wants to finance um, your house, you wouldn't come by yourself to, to use Centrifuge. You would go through, so the, um, yeah. we call them asset originators in, in our system. So the one here, it's called New Silver, is one of the ones doing um, real estate financing. Mm -hmm. And so then you would use their platform. Um, New Silver is then doing all of this legwork on the legal side of things. Mm -hmm. um, so we are, they're actually setting up a legal entity and creating this pool of assets both legally and on chain. Mm -hmm. And so when they are minting this NFT, um, it's, it's actually representing the debt that is owed um, by the individual who is, who's coming to New Silver's platform. And so then when you're investing in Tinlink, you are locking in the die 
uh, you're getting either the, the drop or the tin, and you're also signing a contract um, that's legally mm. binding for new silver in, in the case of you know, actually paying you back. So there is a level of centralization there where like we are going with um, to the T with all the regulations uh, that are set there for us. I mean, it, it restricts us in some ways. For example, it means that we have to do um, KYC on anyone that wants to invest. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully this can start to grow over time and a lot of other DeFi projects are working on this to, to push the system more and more and push the boundaries. But for the moment, it means that um, we, we're not letting our users take too much of a risk because there really is a legal framework that we're working under here and everything is, mm -hmm. um, is enforceable from that perspective. Um, so there's much less risk to the end user, but it does mean that um, you would have to KYC in order to participate in, in Tin Lake. Well, I don't think there is any other way to do it at this point, to be honest, um, because I know a couple of, uh, I, I know one other project uh, who is, uh, which is trying to uh, tokenize real, real estate and um, and yeah, you have to go through the legal steps. There is absolutely no way, uh, no way around that. Um, and uh, yeah, some a third party needs to be involved in the process. Yeah. So, so um, I guess um, it will be very hard to decentralize this process. Like if I have, in the past, I have thought that possibly you might have this, uh, like this asset originator could be just a normal person who somehow makes sure that all the paperwork work is done. But this is, I think it's unrealistic at this point um, like to happen. So I kind of envision tokenization to happen uh, through intermediaries um, like uh, New Silver, as you mentioned, or some kind of like notary services, which decide to um, yeah jump into the blockchain uh, thing and start uh, yeah, verifying documentation and then entering some numbers uh, on a computer so that the token is minted. They might yeah, even not definitely. know yeah, what, what they're doing. But, um, so this is, this is actually the next step that we envision for um, like mm -hmm. what, what's really next on our product roadmap that I'm excited about is opening that up a little bit more past mm -hmm. just this one asset originator like New Silver doing all of this legwork but decentralizing it a little bit more. Um, so we would call this uh, entity underwriters. So these are, these could be, but hopefully in the future, like not just someone who's necessarily calling themselves an underwriter, maybe they are um, someone who's verifying identity or some other consulting agency that happens to have a lot of data on different types of assets. Mm -hmm. And the idea here would be that um, we could have uh, a mechanism for them to basically weigh in on, on the risk of the assets into a, that go into a pool and decide if this asset meets the criteria of a pool or not. So mm -hmm. say the, the pool has a very specific description, um, like real estate between this and this value and mm -hmm. this, inter this and this like maturity date, 12 to 24 months maturity, something like this. Mm -hmm. And so then the underwriters, underwriters would be able to, um, to decide using all of this data that they have to, to vote um, mm -hmm. on chain to decide if this asset should go into this pool or not. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, as an investor, when you're looking at the risk, you're not just relying then only on New Silver anymore, but actually a whole group of underwriters that also have skin in the game um, that are also invested in, in the TIN token. This is how we're imagining it. And so then they would be the first ones to lose money if something were to go wrong. So it's in their best interest to choose assets that fit this risk profile. Um, yeah. And then it's also distributed. So it's not just re relying on one single party to, to make that risk assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really excited about that um, mm -hmm. feature that we want to implement soon. Yeah, this will be really great. Uh, having in mind how hard it is actually to do that. Um, I guess it will be some kind of a form of staking, similar to chaining or Oracle provider, like Oracle data providers, let's, let's call them, that they need to stake a token or just keep keep the thin token. Um, and 
yeah, get slashed or, or yeah, you get the first loss, it is something to force. Um, yeah, exactly. And um, my other question would be like, when, when an asset, for example, a house costs like ten a hundred thousand um, dollars and the user goes to new silver, um, is this asset, um, like when, it, when it's minted into an NFT, is the is the hundred percent of the value kept, or is it like uh, not sure that if the word is correct, but under collateralized, like you, like the user gets not a hundred thousand, but let's say eighty thousand, because uh, yeah, these twenty thousand are kind of like a guarantee that this asset, if needed, will be um, sellable for for the entire uh, yeah amount of collateral that is available on chain. So this actually depends on the asset, the type of asset. Mm -hmm. So some assets you can get almost 100% of the value because you're almost 100% sure that you'd be able to get that full cost back. Mm -hmm. But depending on the asset, for example, with real estate, there would be some assessment that goes in there that you would have to evaluate what this house mm -hmm. is really worth if you needed to sell the asset to pay back the loan, what you'd be able to get. So then the loan that a, uh, a end user can get would depend on, you know, how certain um, uh, the asset originator is that they'd be able to recover the entire cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I also think that there should be a differentiation uh, between assets. Um, yeah, cool. And, and, and then what is the role of that rat token? Is this uh, something like a... Uh, like a token for additional rewards or is this your like the centrifuge token because i don't i, I don't believe it's tradable currently anywhere no it's not tradable and yeah it's interesting you said yeah it is the centrifuge token and we just rebranded actually oh, okay. um so super sadly there was another project that launched that used this name rad and um yeah. so that was run one reason but also it questions like you just asked uh you ask if it's the centrifuge token and we thought it just made sense okay let's just call it the centrifuge token okay. um because it'll make more sense to people so oh. yes it's the centrifuge token it powers a uh, centrifuge chain so mm -hmm. centrifuge chain is a nominated proof of stake um so that means that you need to stake this token in order to run a validator on our chain um you can also stake towards validators as a nominator mm -hmm. and in return for staking this value um, so validators can get slashed but they also get a block reward uh, mm -hmm. that's distributed to the validators and the nominator so that's like um this chain security is probably like the most utilitarian use of the token right now mm -hmm. um, and then it's also used for governance so right mm -hmm. now on chain it's used for things like chain upgrades um, so we're going to be going through another one next week, actually. And mm -hmm. so that will be a, a proposal on chain. Um, and the token is used to vote on that. Mm -hmm. um, and in the future, we also want to be able to use it for voting on things like um, the Tin Lake pools that are on Centrifuge um, and even like more utility that we want to add later on. So we love to have um, our own native money market that's on centrifuge chain mm -hmm. um, so that it's just giving users another option instead of needing to go to Ave or compound then yeah. centrifuge would be another option so mm -hmm. then it would be used to decide basically just how like um, the compound token is used on their chain it's the the same way it could be used for that functionality on centrifuge um, yeah yeah um, cool, but uh, so the, so the, when it when it comes to rewards, usually like in DeFi we talk about like financial kind of rewards, like people uh, are using like are providing security to the network. Actually, the whole security of the network is kind of based on the monetary value of the tokens that are actually securing the, securing the network. So in this case, since I don't believe there is a like, is there a, like a market price. For, for the centrifuge token or? So because it's not traded yet, there's no real market price. And so yeah. that's why we've we've opened up um, access to the token, but um, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty slowly. Um, mm -hmm. So we've given grants to validators um, in order to you know, have a chain with 
um, it, like a little bit less than trusted setup um, because it is open, anyone can start running a validator on Centrifuge Chain, um, mm -hmm. but you do need to get access to the token. Mm -hmm. um, so we've given out grants for that. And so we're kind of in this, like you said, like this middle gray area because the token's not traded yet. Yeah. Um, but we do expect that that will be coming soon. So um, mm -hmm. we're planning on our, our public sale really soon. And so I'm excited about that. And I think, like you said, this will open it up um, a lot yeah. more. Yeah, I think so. And no, it's uh, it shouldn't be very hard. I guess there's some uh, like not technical issues related to that, but you know because you can just go to Uniswap. Um, but yeah, maybe you can you can have your like token to be one of the first ones on uh, Uniswap version three. I guess <laughs> that'll be that'll be very exciting. Um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, so I guess you have this hybrid hybrid approach between like centralization and decentralization, uh, like from a, from a technological point of view, from a functional point of view. So it's very interesting. Um, but I guess, as you said, you're you're moving towards uh, like decentralizing the components one by one, um, yeah. uh, like in time. So so you mentioned uh, like there is a token sale possibly coming up, um, and then you also mentioned this. Uh, decentralization of the asset originator function. Is there something else that we should, uh, or are you excited about in Centrifuge? Um, or yeah, in to for, for like tokenization in general? I think, I mean, the other thing that, that we're doing is um, we are launching in the Polkadot ecosystem really soon. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited about that because I really think this interoperability between different DeFi projects is super important to increase the liquidity for the entire DeFi ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I really don't think that can happen if it's all on one chain, for example. So I'm really excited to see like all the different projects that are starting to pop up. Um, Polkadot is one ecosystem. You mentioned Cosmos as well. Um, there's a lot of other chains that have that just launched this year. Um, so I'm really excited to see how those things start growing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think right now we're planning um, integrations with different projects like uh, Maker and Aave. So we're yeah. really close to the final vote with Maker to get um, a couple of our Tin Lake pools accepted as collateral into DAI. Nice. And I think this will really open up, um, like for the side of Maker, I think it can really help them diversify the types of collateral that are backing DAI. And I think that will make DAI that much stronger as a stable coin. Mm -hmm. And then for us, it will open up a lot of liquidity um, for all of the people that want to borrow on the other side of Tin Lake. Mm -hmm. And it'll make it that much easier to, um, to scale basically. So I'm really excited for that too. Nice, yeah. This is uh, definitely Dai is, uh, is one of the the greatest, like the best project in the space. And yeah, being able to stake an asset and get a, a Dai loan for it is really, I think, should be the goal of any like tokenization project out there. Um, and yeah, when it comes to tokenization, um, like what do you what do you think are like, like the biggest challenges? Are there regulatory challenges or um, because, you know, I think more and more people in the DeFi space, like, like, because I've spoken to a couple of, and they are, okay, so how does this thing uh, make sense? Like when you go, for example, to Aave, you need to lock cryptocurrency to get more cryptocurrency. So uh, why can't we just lock something else? Like, why can't I lock uh, some, like the value of my bicycle, let's say, and then get a loan uh, in DAI for that or whatever, USC uh, or yeah, any crypto. Like, what, what is the challenge here? Uh, we mentioned actually that, uh, yeah, there's possibly some speci specialization of this uh, or asset origination function is needed, but is there anything else that is problematic? I mean, the main thing that we've um, struggled with is laying this legal foundation um, and mm -hmm. like structural foundation uh, to start with. I think now that we've really set up like a, a baseline, like a, an actual structure um, that works, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. it makes it that much easier for someone else to come along and and repeat the same thing they know exactly the steps to follow and what to do and it makes it so that um, we can start growing this whole space a lot faster because I think for a lot of crypto projects uh, compared to like when you're doing a normal tech startup there are so many more legal challenges that you have to face that a normal tech founder doesn't even have to think about. But all of a sudden, because it has to do with crypto, you're starting to spend a lot more money on lawyers and legal fees and like coming up with really complex um, corporate structures that normal tech companies, they don't even have to think about. Yeah. Um, and I think that because a lot of projects have come this far, they've laid the foundation for other projects to come after us and say, hey, okay, this is how they did it. Um, I can just copy that framework and get hit the ground running. And I think that makes it a lot easier now going forward that like a lot of people have sort of trailblazed this process. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like, I hope we're through the toughest part of it now. Mm -hmm. um, for sure, there's more legal challenges that we need to figure out. For example, like taxes are a big one that mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are starting to think about. And um, it's really tough for the end user right now to think about taxes and how they're doing their crypto taxes, especially if they're really participating in different DeFi projects, then oh. it can become a mess super quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is the next place where like I'm seeing some people are starting to lay the foundation of how we can make that better. But I think like all of these little steps we're we're moving slowly through them now, but I think we're laying a way for it to to start growing much much faster yeah this is this is how innovation kind of happens uh, regulation follows uh, uh, in the in the background but yeah like a year or two years behind like technical progress i would say um, yeah but yeah this, so when you when you mention about like when you talk about the legal framework are you referring to like a, like where is centrifuge based is it germany or like, uh, does it does it apply German a German framework or a European one or is there a so there's I mean there's a framework for how centrifuge works and then there's a framework for how our tin like DAP works right yeah. and they're two separate things so centrifuge for us we had to think about um, you know if we're going to raise money how are we doing that there's no legal structure for a DAO right now um, mm -hmm. so it's really hard to to raise money in this way when like um, most countries wouldn't even recognize it, really. Yeah. And so then we decided to set up a foundation, uh, set up a foundation in Switzerland. And mm -hmm. so then this would be the entity that's um, sort of uh, leading the development of the network. Mm -hmm. And then we have our company that's based in Germany, a GmbH, and this is our development company. So mm -hmm. then this would be uh, hopefully long term, one of several companies that could develop for the centrifuge network as a whole mm -hmm. so this would be like our vision for like the way the legal framework works for centrifuge but then for tin lake it's like a whole other thing with um these asset originators that need to think about the whole legal framework for being able to let investors lock their die and invest in in these assets yeah. And so that was, I think, um, something that we really trailblazed. And I hope that we can say we laid a structure there that a lot of other projects could come and repeat too. Yeah, hopefully. Um, actually, maybe you know this, but there is this uh, market in uh, crypto assets a regulation that is uh, being developed currently by the European Commission. And um, yeah, um, sure. Hopefully it will not be too restrictive because uh, these things that you mentioned uh, uh, were, are, are definitely like this kind of a regulatory R&D that needs to be kept and possibly followed. Um, I'm not sure if you have provided uh, or, or there's like a German blockchain association or something that you participate in, but um, yeah, it, it's good to kind of, it's a good idea to participate in this legal process so that your your ideas and like uh, uh, your know-how gets kind of incorporated in that regulation because that's going to be covering in the entire the entire European Union. Um, so yeah, uh, we actually the Sophie Crypto Meetup community managed to 
to submit a uh, recommendation to on that. Not sure if it will be considered, but um, yeah, we did as much as we can to, to push it in the right direction. Um, all right, so cool. Um, I guess we, we talked about tokenization and centrifuge and let's let's jump into, uh, well, we also talked about DeFi, but um, yeah, like let's jump into DeFi. So, so, so how excited <laughs> are you about DeFi? And is there something that you're not like you, you, you think could be improved in DeFi. Uh, that's something that you don't like, and uh, yeah, think that uh, yeah should be improved as soon as possible. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess. I mean, I would say in general, I'm really excited about it. I think it's definitely sparked a lot of innovation, um, and I think not just like financial innovation and how people are using DeFi, but also for crypto as a whole. Because DeFi brought so many users, it forced a lot of um, like the tools that people use to, to become much better um, for DeFi users specifically. And so I think for me, that was also really exciting. Um, it's hard to make your product better if, if nobody's using it. And so having just that many users come into the space, I think really made a difference. Um, but I think you touched sort of on one, one thing that I'd love to see change, which is that right now, DeFi is 100% is crypto-based. Um, you're, you're only um, using other crypto as collateral. And I think that only goes so far. Um, there's definitely something to be said of like crypto as money being used as collateral, but I think it's forgetting that we do have all kinds of other assets in the world um, trillions of dollars worth of, of assets that are out there, right? That right. are that have value that can be unlocked through DeFi. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one thing that excites me about Centrifuge is that we're just one small piece in it, but I think um, there's a lot of potential to bring in these so-called real world assets mm -hmm. into the, the blockchain space, into DeFi. Um, and I think that will like, one, grow the DeFi space exponentially. And two, it would like unlock a lot of access for people who weren't able to go to traditional financial institutions and ask for a loan. Because mm -hmm. the main problem today, for example, if someone wanted to get um, a loan for an invoice and they're a freelancer and they're invoicing, like let's say, I don't know, um, Pepsi or something like this, yeah. and they did some freelance work, I mean, Pepsi might not pay them for like three months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and for this whole amount of time, you're just waiting to get money. And maybe there's a lot of productivity you're missing on there because mm -hmm. you don't have this capital in the meantime. And so I think we'll actually see a lot more productivity in, in total if we're able to unlock this, this, this value for people. So yeah. that's one thing that I think DeFi can really give to the traditional financial space is like really breaking down those barriers for people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think this this is little by little happening. And it's happening slow, slower than uh, NFTs and DeFi, like pure DeFi applications in general due to this uh, the, the, uh, regulatory um, uh, yeah, delays, let's call them. Um, or imperfections that that exist. Um, and are you in, in any way like worried about scalability? Um, like, do you think, um, uh, yeah, the scalability problem on Ethereum will be solved soon? And what do you think will be the most uh, like viable option to solve that? Like, uh, do you think uh, in this interconnectedness between the chains? Do you think this will solve the, the scalability issue or it will be solved like um, internally in Ethereum by, for example, let's say um, uh, like Ethereum 2.0 or the, uh, not the, what, what was it? The, uh, sorry, I forgot the name. This, uh, uh, well, the layer two solutions in, in general or like yeah. which one will come first or where do you see a solution? Um, so I, I do agree scalability is a huge problem, and that's why we built centrifuge chain is because originally we were thinking of doing a side chain to Ethereum, 
and using ETH 2.0. And then we realized that's not coming anytime soon. <laughs> so yeah. that's why we built our own chain. And um, it's why we're going to be moving our chain like that from Ethereum to that chain. And it's going to make the cost hundreds of times cheaper and hundreds of times faster, if not more. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a huge problem and that's how we're addressing it. I would say on Ethereum for the existing DeFi projects there, I expect the layer two solutions to come faster than ETH2. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the ones that looks the most pro promising is um, optimism. Yeah. Um, so I feel like that has real potential to help Ethereum project scale. But I think that we're going to see much better scalability on other chains faster than that even. Um, so I'm more excited to see how um, the Cosmos and the Polkadot ecosystems develop because I think they'll be able to scale much faster actually mm -hmm. than Ethereum or even the layer two solutions on Ethereum. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're completely aware of this, but usually when, when we talk about scalability, we talk about it in this uh, in the background of um, like security and trustlessness. So I think there is uh, um, like people might prefer Ethereum or the slow version of Ethereum due, due to this uh, large uh, network uh, effect that it has. And also um, this um, perception of it being like decentralized and trustless and uh, uh, especially currently with the proof of work uh, like system on um, um, I think this is also a major point about blockchain. So if we want to move to something that is more scalable, I mean, the solution is there. I think I, I, we, we can create a centralized solution. It will be infinitely more scalable and cheaper to use. But I think that the trick is to kind of make it scalable, um, but also to keep as much of the decentralization and the trustedness at least um, as possible. And uh, you know, everyone is anxious about proof of stake, uh, especially like moving such a large network with so much value uh, as Ethereum to a proof of stake system. Um, so I'm interested to understand like, what do you think about proof of stake? Like, do you think it's inferior or superior to proof of work uh, when it comes to like civil uh, attacks or yeah, consensus? Um, so I actually, I really like proof of stake as a system. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's superior to proof of work in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. There's definitely trade-offs between the two. I think for me, the major thing is that it, um, it actually opens up the ability for a lot more um, different types of entities to run uh, validator nodes. This is the main thing that I think is an improvement upon proof of work mm -hmm. because I can't run a node right now for Ethereum or for Bitcoin. It just doesn't make sense. But I can run a node for Centrifuge Chain. I can run one for Polkadot. Um, I could probably run one for, for Cosmos. Um, so this is where I think proof of stake is really exciting for me, that it opens up this, this sort of potential. But then because of these trade-offs, you see projects pop up like Decred. I don't know if you're aware of them, but they're an example of something that's even trying to combine the two. And they have an element of their chain that's proof of work and an element that's proof of stake. Yeah. And I think this is also a really interesting experiment to combine that. Um, so I think like I'm really excited for the potential of proof of stake. I think it's not tested as much as proof of work so far because Ethereum and Bitcoin are many times larger, um, Bitcoin especially, right? So yeah. I think there's a lot of testing still that, that I'd like to see with proof of stake, but so far, there's huge amounts of value on a lot of these proof of stake networks. Um, and there isn't any large um, issue that we've seen come up yet. And so mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm relatively confident in the security of a very large cap proof of stake chain. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are some positive um, trade-offs that you're getting for using proof of stake. I think um, like maybe just to point out one thing that is actually a myth is mm -hmm. um, using the energy argument for against proof of work. Cause I think a lot of people will try to bring this up as a, th mm -hmm. a point against um, Bitcoin. Yeah. And I think in many ways it's actually just not true 
um, to say that it's using a crazy amount of, of energy. It's, it's using like less energy than a lot of existing financial infrastructure. Yeah. And a lot of mining re operations are using renewable energy now. So yeah. I think that's definitely not something to bring up in the, in the comparison of the two. Um, so definitely like yeah. would dispel that myth for sure. Yeah. But, um, but there are trade-offs between the two. Um, so I do think it's interesting to see the different options out there. Um, and I, I am super curious to see how they will grow. But in terms of security, I am confident in, in proof of stake, um, given that there is enough value at stake in the system. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This argument about the energy use of Bitcoin has been coming up in the group. Uh, it's just like one of the standards of thought um messages out there that we have to battle again and again and again and explain that it's almost entirely renewables um and it's also much less than whatever like other financial banking systems are are using um i also agree that um yeah it's very it's going to be interesting to, to see how a proof of stake um, develops in the future uh because as you said uh, it's hard to 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 run a Bitcoin wallet, and I have actually run a Bitcoin wallet for a while, but then my computer just uh, yeah got burned and uh, stopped working. And yeah. Was, yeah, I've I've tried to come up with a solution. I tried Raspberry Pi, but that, that also didn't work. Um, and now I'm just looking at some uh, pre-made Bitcoin wallets that I can I can purchase, but I haven't done this uh, yet. And you know, with staking, it's so much um, easier. You just basically deposit or delegate to someone your stake and then it's all, it's all, it's all done. And uh, there, are, there are indeed more stakers, uh, let's, let's say like Ethereum 0.2 stakers even out there than uh, I, I'm one, but I'm doing it through a centralized solution, which is the, the Kraken exchange. Uh, but there are definitely more stakers than um, mm, at least that I know uh, in comparison to Bitcoin full nodes and uh, that, that are that are around, and not to mention min miners because those are a bit less. But but uh, absolutely, I think uh, Bitcoin is definitely currently the most secure, uh, yeah, system system, and uh, I think it's uh, it's it will stay as a proof of work system for all eternity, I guess. <laughs> cool. And um, before going to NFTs, real, real quick. Um, we saw this uh, like rapid increase in the price of Cardano like uh, a few weeks ago. And I personally was quite surprised to see that happening um, because I think there is not enough fundament behind it. Uh, I mean, we are in a bull market now and Cardano is uh, doing a great job with marketing with, with, uh, with their founder being, um, yeah, spending a lot of time uh, talking directly to the community, doing videos. Um, but like, what do you think about Cardano? I, I'm interested to 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 know. <laughs> um, I actually I don't have a very like well formed opinion about Cardano. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that um, maybe it's surprising that the the price skyrocketed so much. Um, but I would just attribute that to the fact that um, it's a bull market and all kinds of projects are raising absurd amounts of money right now. Um, it's sure. it's kind of like, I mean, you mentioned the, the ICO craze. It almost feels like we're, we're mm -hmm. in a place very similar to that right now where yeah. people are raising a lot of money on just the white paper, um, mm -hmm. which, to us is like, I mean, it's it's really interesting to see. Um, I think some of these projects I'm excited about, um, for example, Mina, uh, which used to be called Coda is one that I think like actually does have a lot of merit and they're, I think they're doing a sale either now or soon or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, but Cardano, I'm I'm not so sure. I, I don't know enough to, to say it's, um, yeah. it's baseless, but I, I can say that I haven't heard a lot uh, about yeah. the project that's substantial. Yeah, um, exactly. So, so what what do you think is what, what do you think are the chances of of maybe not only Cardano but some of the other um, chains um, to to kind of uh, displace this dominant position that uh, Ethereum has 
when it comes to um, DeFi applications or applications in general and centralized applications? I mean, I think there's a lot of potential there. I think it's more of a, a question of time. Mm -hmm. So Ethereum has, has been around for much longer than any of these other chains. They've built mm -hmm. out an entire ecosystem, not just of people, but of developer tools, of mm -hmm. a lot of other um, building blocks that you need when it comes to like building up to be able to have a real DeFi product. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is something that has now just had a lot of time to develop for Ethereum. It's going to take time for these same things to develop for new projects, for new yeah. ecosystems. So I do think it will happen. Um, I think it's more of a question of how long will it take yeah. for us to see a real like DeFi ecosystem on some of these other mm -hmm. chains. Yeah. Um, so in this future of, of, this, uh, of interconnected chains, like why would a chain be dominant? Like, do you have any ideas? Like, will it be just because of some kind of specialization? Like for example, let's say Ethereum 2.0 will be the finance blockchain or finance and banking blockchain. And then we'll have blockchains for, for other like, um, like uses. Or um, yeah, how do you imagine this multi-blockchain future? I think there's going to be a lot of things to consider. Probably a, an element of it will be specialization. So maybe there are chains that you would use specifically for preserving your privacy. Yeah. Um, maybe there are chains that you would use like Mina that's specifically made for more of a like mobile lightweight application. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's like maybe different things to consider there based on the use case, you would probably choose a different chain um, that is specialized specifically for that use case. So mm -hmm. that's part of our, our um, reasoning behind creating centrifuge chain. It's not that we want our chain to be the chain for lots of different projects to use. No, it's actually a special purpose chain that mm -hmm. we created specifically for our use case. And it makes it the most efficient for our specific use case. Mm -hmm. um, and it wouldn't necessarily be the most efficient for someone else's use case, like a stable coin, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think this will definitely be a question going forward is um, how these different chains start to specialize themselves into very specific use cases. Um, maybe with Ethereum, it is that it's the most secure place um, that you would want to use like more high value projects, um, mm -hmm. just as an example. Yeah. But we, we, I wouldn't say that we know that yet because we yeah. haven't seen what these other chains are like. Um, mm -hmm. I think I'm a little bit skeptical about ETH2, like when it's coming and how scalable mm -hmm. um, ETH will be long term. And I think that would make it so that if you wanted something where the transactions should be a lot cheaper to transact really easily, then you probably wouldn't use Ethereum. Yeah. Um, so those are just like a few examples of maybe how you would specialize these different chains and then where the use of, of those chains will start to go long term. Mm -hmm. And this is actually uh, pointing out to uh, something that is already happening. I think um, yeah, liquidity is kind of flowing into uh, one uh, chain that is different from Ethereum. And I'm talking about Binance Smart Chain specifically. Uh, we see that the pancake swap um, only soft version basically of, or yeah, uh, AMM is attracting a lot of liquidity. So I'm not sure how much of it is real liquidity, but um, yeah, um, obviously there is kind of a, yeah, like a, like a process of moving uh, uh, some projects and users and liquidity to that chain. Like, how do you feel about uh, this move? Because I, I, I personally think that maybe it's not ideal, but uh, really when, when you compare doing transactions on Ethereum, uh, when the grade price is let's say 300, and uh, and doing doing it on minus smart chain is just minus smart chain is like a breeze of, of fresh air. But like um, uh, I'm not so sure about the, how how decentralized and trusted the trust list it, it is uh, currently. Um, but yeah, how do you feel about like uh, this liquidity uh, flowing into a chain that has some kind of a questionable uh, yeah, decentralization, so to say. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think it brings into the question like the risk that you're taking there. 
um, with your funds because with something that is decentralized like Ethereum, the possibility of losing access to your funds mm -hmm. is, is just, you know, whether you lose your keys or not, um, not your keys, not your coins, right? So I think that really applies when it's Ethereum and Bitcoin. You have full, full access of those funds and you can be very confident in the security of those funds. But something that is not decentralized, um, like the Binance Smart Chain, I think you're then questioning who is really in control of that network and whether they have the ability to prevent you accessing your funds on that chain. So, I, I mean, I can't speak to someone's use case when they're going to use that chain. Maybe it's not some, it may be something where they feel comfortable taking that risk. Mm -hmm. um, and I can say like, for sure there will be examples where people are okay taking this sort of risk, but just that people are keeping it in mind that it is a risk that they're taking when yeah. they use a chain like this. And you have to be, I think, hyper aware that there is a possibility of, um, of like deplatforming you, of kicking you off, of um, taking away your funds completely in the worst case scenario. Um, and then I think one interesting way that people tried to prove this point, um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you saw that they, they posted some sort of like controversial politics um, on the Binance chain. Uh, and yeah. they wanted to see if it was going to be censored or not. Yeah. And I think it's it's controversial how they tried to prove the point, but I think the point in itself was was worth um, bringing up, which is that um, it is a question of who's really in control of, of that chain. And um, it's always good to keep in mind whichever like layer one chain that you're using, that you're understanding who is actually in control of this network. And mm -hmm. am I really the one who is in control of my funds or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, yeah, so let's see. And also, there were a couple of, uh, I believe there was a so called a rug pool of a couple of million. And I think a, a number of people expected that uh, Binance Smart Chain will be forked in order to recover these losses. But this didn't happen. And so far, this Tiananmen Square addition to the chain is uh, still not to remove. So, so far, I think. Um, yeah, this decentralization idea is still uh, still strong when it comes to uh, well, strong, relatively strong when it comes to Binance Smart Chain. Uh, they haven't done anything drastic yet, uh, but yeah, it remains to be seen. Um, so just before jumping again to NFTs, which is also super interesting, and then finalizing with a couple of uh, price questions and project questions, um, I, I just thought about a, a question that I had. So. Uh, and that's related to tokenomics, uh, I guess. Um, so you mentioned that these, uh, the, the um, life silver, I, I, I believe, uh, is currently doing this uh, real world blockchain connection. Uh, how, are, how, are, how are they incentivized to do it? Uh, do they receive uh, tokens or, um, yeah, how, how, how are they part of, of this game theoretical model there? there? Can you repeat, repeat the first part? Um, so, so this the, the life silver uh, originators, um, asset originator. So, yeah. so they are uh, they are they participate in in the process of uh, like tokenizing basically these real world assets. So they're a, um, a party in in the system in a way. So um, I, I'm just wondering like how how are they um, compensated? For that work, um, like what is the game theoretical model? Like, uh, like how how does the system include them and rewards them for doing that work? Yeah, so they're I mean they're businesses, right? So they're the ones that are facing the end user. Um, mm -hmm. So when they're going out trying to find people who want uh, real estate loans, you know they're really trying to get users themselves. Mm -hmm. And the way that they're making money is um, by taking a, a small percentage on the, the fee that's charged for this, uh, for this loan. Mm -hmm. So if a user is coming to New Silver, um, maybe New Silver is charging them like 7.2%. Um, 
and they're taking 0.2%. These aren't real numbers, just giving an example. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's how New Silver would make money in this system, um, mm -hmm. is by being able to be that face to the end user and being able to take a percentage on the interest rate there. Okay. So they're definitely interested in bringing in users, bringing in assets um, mm -hmm. and getting financing because that's the way that they're going to grow but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are um, the only party that should be assessing the risk of these assets. And mm -hmm. so that's why we'd love to introduce this underwriter system is that it's not all relying on new silver because mm -hmm. of course they are profit driven and they are one specific entity with one specific perspective on these assets. Mm -hmm. And the more actors that we think we can get into that system, we think the better that we would be able to assess the risk of a specific loan and ideally long term there would be some competition here where you're even getting more and more competitive rates to the end user because of this um, competitive underwriting system that would be like long-term vision of this is that we're not only unlocking access to this financing but even giving better interest rates than you would be able to get at a bank and you're giving also free, let's call them freelancers, um, some additional um, yeah, income stream by becoming asset originators, let's say. So, okay, perfect. Great. Thank you for, for, for the answer. Um, then NFTs. Um, so what do you think is happening? Because I think to, to, to a number of people, um, yeah, we are currently, the NFT sector is, is, is uh, what's happening here, what, what was happening with the ICO sector. I think that's, that's where this craziness that we saw in 2007 is best expressed. It's not even that much in DeFi, I would say, but uh, I guess in, in NFTs. So yeah, I'm sure everyone knows a favorite celebrity of theirs that's selling an NFT right now. Yeah, exactly. Everyone is <laughs> jumping on the NFT train. Um, yeah. So, so what do you think uh, will, it will, will happen, or what, what do you think is happening? And what do you, do you think will happen when we enter the bear market, which at some point will come, definitely. Um, so what, what's going to happen with NFTs and like what's going to happen with the values, uh, value there or value, um, the valuations of art pieces there? I mean, I think it is definitely a crazy market right now because of the bull market. I even saw a meme earlier today that showed like the number of NFT sellers is enormous. And the number of people buying NFTs is really small in comparison. Um, there's just so many people selling NFTs now. Um, it's a little bit wild. And I think for me, it's really exciting again in terms of like the innovation that's coming out of it, just because you have so many people running to these platforms, mm -hmm. you really get a chance to see what's, what can be fixed, what users are really looking for when they're really using these products. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's a super exciting outcome of this. Um, but I do think a lot of these prices are inflated, um, especially because people are probably um, feeling positive effects from the bull market. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe suddenly they have a lot more capital and so they have a lot of extra income that they can use for something as, as silly as an NFT. For me, the huge concern that I have that I think we're gonna start to see some movement in is actually like on the regulatory side, not even necessarily regulatory, but really just like um, asking the hard question, what is this NFT really representing? And I think for some people when they're buying an NFT that's representing a piece of art, they assume that they're actually buying the right to that art, that piece of art. For example, if they wanted to put it on display somewhere, you're assuming if I buy the NFT, I'm buying the right to display this NFT in public, in a museum or something like this. And actually in many cases, that's not even true. Um, so this is, I think, one of the interesting things with this new trend is like, what are you actually buying with the NFT? Are you getting like the legal right to this piece of art or are you just buying an NFT? Um, and, and that can be fun, but is it like, is it worth, you know, 1500 euros fund? Um, yeah. or that's a, couple, a different question. Yeah, or a couple of million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, and also I think another concern is that um, the actual file that, like, that this token is connected to 
um, it's not, it's usually not stored it's on the blockchain and somewhere in, in the IPFS or some other storage storage solution. And if that storage solution uh, disappears, like what are you left with? <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is another, I think, uh, problematic thing that uh, I think it's, uh, it's starting to attract more attention. Um, but I think what, what would be interesting, and I think we're seeing this, uh, is uh, using NFTs as collateral for loans. So this is another type of asset, I guess, that could be used for loans. Um, but do you think that <laughs> this could actually work? Uh, I mean, there are projects that combine uh, high, um, like expensive NFTs into uh, like a single fund. And then this fund uh, uh, distributes, I think, or represents some kind of value. Um, and then uh, this value could be used as a collateral. But, but in the form of uh, singular, singular or individual NFTs, do you think this, this this can work? Like, if I have a NFT that I bought for a thousand five hundred, um, can I uh, deposit it somewhere and get at least five hundred dollars out of it uh, in terms of a loan? Um, like, can can this happen? I mean, that's definitely something that we're looking at tin, using Tin Lake for. So right now, that's that's exactly what we're doing. But the collateral is a real world asset. Yeah. So we're minting the NFT, but it's representing, you know, an actual house. Um, yeah. This is just making it a little bit more crypto focused. Now the NFT is representing the this art that's behind it. Um, the NFT itself is what's having value because it's on chain. It's already originating there. Mm -hmm. And so I think the same concept that we've been using for Tinlink would work for this, um, that you own a valuable NFT that you'd be able to lock it into a, a, a pool of different NFTs that are similar mm -hmm. and be able to get a loan um, for that NFT. And I think it should work effectively the same. The only thing that I think could be different is the amount of the loan that you'd be able to get. Probably since it would be considered a riskier asset, you yeah. wouldn't be able to get as high of a percentage of the actual value as with a house. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it changes anything else about how the, the system is set up and how it works. I think mm -hmm. you should be able to do that. Like you have mm -hmm. a valuable NFT, you should be able to lock it as collateral and, and get a loan for it. And I think that's something mm -hmm. that we'll probably see super soon. I think that's kind of exciting. Yeah. That, that would be a great service to have uh, yeah, the, when the bull market ends, I think. <laughs> we'll find it very, very valuable. <laughs> um, all right, so final questions. Um, would you like to share some, like some of your favorite projects just so that our community members uh, yeah, are aware of yeah, different perspectives? I know that we have a lot of uh, investors looking for, for interesting projects, the promising projects. So, um, and I don't, I, I don't really have that much time to kind of explore the, the vast universe of, of projects. And there are so many appearing on a daily basis. Um, so, so what are projects? Uh, what projects are you interested uh, mainly, apart from Bitcoin and Ethereum, of course? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm definitely not giving investment advice to anyone, yes, but uh, just like speaking from the perspective of of projects that I find interesting. Um, I mean, maybe to rattle off a list, like um, I think the graph is something that's super interesting in the Ethereum mm -hmm. ecosystem. Um, we've used them a lot in in Centrifuge. And they're growing a lot. And I think it's really exciting to see um, that team moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. The project that I mentioned earlier, um, Mina, that used to be known as Coda, they're launching soon. And I think they're a super exciting project to follow. Um, mm -hmm. But probably the most interesting space that I've mentioned a few times already is like that Polkadot ecosystem. Yeah. Um, so Polkadot is launching parachains really soon. and. I think this will be really exciting to see the new projects that get started there. So mm -hmm. some of the projects that we've collaborated with a lot because we're, we're all working towards the same goal have been uh, Kala is one of them that's doing a stable coin in the Polkadot ecosystem um, and they haven't launched yet. And um, Moonbeam is another one that mm -hmm. we've worked with a lot in terms of just, you know, being able to collaborate on different technical issues that come up 
And I think for me, this is um, a great sign in a project um, that you're actually able to openly, collaboratively discuss different issues um, that everyone's facing. And I think for me, it's like, uh, it makes me excited to see how much collaboration is happening in, in the crypto space. Um, mm -hmm. And it, I think it makes it that much more um, promising that we're going to have a multi-chain future mm -hmm. and a very interoperable future. Yeah. Um, so I think this will only be a positive thing for the entire ecosystem. Yeah, great. Thanks for, for this project. I actually haven't looked into those, but I definitely will. And I, I know that Polkadot is, is quite you know, like interested. They're planning to, to, be, to do this uh, parachain auctions pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, and I think there are only 100 parachains. Uh, am, I, am I correct? Like 100 um, slots uh, um, for parachains, right? So there will be limited slots. It will probably start much smaller even in the beginning. So I okay. think in the very beginning, they will only do one auction, um, maybe oh. each week or something like this. Oh, okay. They still need to announce all of the yeah. exact details, but it would be like a really slow start. And then eventually it would probably get to maybe somewhere around a hundred slots. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. then in the beginning, it will definitely be competitive. So some of these projects that I mentioned, you know, we would have to be competing with them also for these slots, but, yeah. um, but I think it, I think like, um, long-term it will really be more of a collaboration, uh, mm -hmm. amongst projects. And, and actually you, you'll be competing on how much dot you lock or, or is, is the competition like something else? Yeah, it would be dot that is locked to okay. secure the slot. Yeah, perfect. All right, great. And then final questions. Um, again, not investment advice, obviously, but where do you see the um, Ethereum and Bitcoin prices uh, by the end Ooh, of the <laughs> That's a super tough question. I really have no idea. Yeah. I mean, because okay. I think like, I'm just, um, I guess I'm, I'm like, maybe more risk adverse like i'm more nervous about how crazy the market is getting yeah. but who knows when the top is i mean people keep saying it and they're like oh celebrities minting nfts that's like a signal that we've got to the top yeah. um but then it just keeps going and so like yeah. who's who's to say really um yeah. i definitely wouldn't be one to predict it but i think like for me, it's it's really exciting just how much progress that we're getting from the fact that these prices have gone up so much. It makes the whole space get a lot of attention. Yes. Um, and I think even if we go into a bear market, like that attention will stay. Um, yes. There are tons of institutions, like traditional institutions that have now put money into Bitcoin mm -hmm. and, and even ETH. So I think this is like a huge sign that it's it's not going away. And yeah. even these really old school traditional companies have put their own treasuries into this. Yeah. And I think there are more projects that uh, will be more conscious of the fact that the bear, the bear market will not last forever. And they will probably diversify their portfolios uh, like from token to something more stable, like from tokens to something more stable so that they can live through the, um, the like through the bear markets and uh, being able to kind of grow through that time and and reach the next bull market possibly after i don't know three four years but i think what's primarily pushing the market up currently is just the power of um, so-called burr uh so basically central banks printing uh, enormous amounts of, of money so i think this is for me this is like the biggest signal like if they stop printing maybe the good times so, will will also start rolling. But as, as long as this is happening, I think uh, there is a low chance that the bull market will end. Of course, there are other like, factors that could influence, but um, yeah, I think I think we, we, we might see even like uh, possibly might see uh, higher valuations of the top, top crypto projects. All right, so um, yeah, uh, we are a bit like four minutes maybe over time, but that's that's, that's perfectly fine. So uh, thank you super much for like, uh, thank you a lot for, for this conversation. Uh, it was uh, really, really enjoyable. And I, and I hope uh, it was also enjoyable for the people who are watching or who will be watching the recording um, after. And um, yeah, uh, 
if you if you are ever around Sofia, uh, we will and and possibly we are post pandemic times. It will be uh, really great to have uh, like a physical meetup or meet you in person here um, here in Sofia. So you're always welcome, and anyone from from Central Future is welcome. If you guys also have some major announcements to do, please get in touch with us. I'm sure the community will uh, will appreciate them. So thank you very much, and uh, see you in the in the, in crypto Twitter, I guess. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me today, and thanks everyone for for watching this. Thanks. See you around. Bye bye. Awesome. Bye.